Everything leads to this house where Lauren was or is. Polygraphing an ex-con. Do you even want to see someone get hurt? Yes. Why won't you release the videos? Door knocks. Not no cameras, yeah. Roadblocks. Can we talk to you for just a second? Brush offs. Why won't you talk with uh, Lauren's parents? And a prison sit down that could lead to the final piece of the puzzle. I think I'm one interview away from putting this case together. Just tell us where Lauren is. Looking for Lauren. Here's Brian Ross. Party night in a college town. There's just so many people around and out at all hours. There was always something going on. At Kilroy's Bar in Bloomington, Indiana, students from Indiana University pack the place and then head home in the early morning hours. You feel very close-knit there. There was never like a question of me being unsafe. Yet it was shortly after leaving Kilroy's, five years ago this month, that 20-year-old Lauren Spear, a sophomore from New York, vanished off the streets of Bloomington and has not been seen since. I really just would like to hear this is where you can find your daughter. It's the not knowing what happened to her, where she might be, or, you know, it's, it's unbearable. But tonight, Lauren Spears' parents may be getting closer to knowing what happened. They came from up this direction. For more than a year, 2020 has been tracking a reinvigorated investigation. Surveillance cameras. With the help of former FBI cold case agent Brad Garrett, now an ABC News consultant, retracing her every step. Last seen actually at this intersection. The last time she was seen alive is exactly where we're standing. I really just would like to be able to bring Lauren home. I'm looking at Lauren Spear grew up in the New York City suburb of Scarsdale. What are you going to be? I'm going to be a princess. You're going to be a She's a great kid, uh, high energy, very caring. Very caring. Loving. I love you. You love me. She really had a zest for life. <laughs> I love that. I know. That's so Lauren. Her heartbroken mother and father, Charlene and Rob Spear, that made me cry, honey. Try now to smile through their tears as they remember the good times. The child ballerina. Mom and Dad, I just want to say thank you. I'm having an amazing night and I love you too so much. The coming of age at her bat mitzvah. We're proudest of how she handles herself her boundless potential, and her joy in living life. You are proud parents. Yeah, we're very proud. So proud. Very proud. The call that ended her parents' dreams for Lauren came on June 3rd, 2011. We were eating dinner, and Robbie, the phone rang. I went to answer the phone, and Robbie said, Char, Lauren's missing. So, it's really... Heart stopping, you know? Lauren Spear has become a household name. One of the highest profile missing person cases in America. We believe that the chances are very great that there was foul play because otherwise we, we feel Lauren would have made contact by now. My first thing is to say to the person that has Lauren or that has harmed Lauren, shame on you. Shame on you. You're on the search of fire. Search. Search. Okay. Hundreds of volunteers you walk up and down the streets, check dumpsters, yeah. check alleyways. Join Lauren's parents. Make sure you pay attention to the creek area while you're down there. Okay. Full of hope she would be found safe and soon. I came out today just to help look for Lauren, and it's just a lot of massive territory. They searched abandoned quarries. We're continuing the search that we started. Dense forests. So you're in this massive area and you're driving, here's another pull off, let's pull off. And then you get out of the car and then you go walking through these woods and you're calling Lauren's name and you're hoping you're gonna find her laying in the, the woods somewhere and uh, it's tough, you know. Um, Let me be firm in that we're here 
still committed to finding her. It's our worst nightmare. Kardashian and Seacrest now tweeting for volunteers to join the search. A massive search and a $100,000 reward have turned up little. And then, as a last-ditch effort, police searched the landfill used by the city of Bloomington. Probably the hardest thing that, that we had to do in the searches was to go to that landfill. Yeah. Stand there and watch them. The search turned up empty. I start my every day hoping that today is a day. I go to sleep every night knowing that I have failed and that I haven't. I'm sorry. I haven't done enough. Have done but, enough. Um... After June 3rd, it really um, started to sink in that this was happening. 11 days and counting since Lauren vanished. The search for Lauren Spear now stretches into a second month. This Sunday marks the one year anniversary of the disappearance of IU student Lauren Spear. Today, the missing person posters are all but gone around the Bloomington campus, and the name Lauren Spear is a thing of the past to many. So, so when I say the name Lauren Spear, it doesn't really ring a bell. Mm -mm. There's not really much talk of it anymore, no. It's the old news. I think we should let it go and get and move on. But quietly, behind the scenes, the case is very much alive. We're getting close. I think we're going to solve this. Former FBI agent Garrett and a team of private detectives hired by Lauren's parents have now turned up new witnesses, leads, and theories. Everything leads to this house where Lauren was or is. Garrett started with those closest to Lauren and the young men she was with the night she disappeared. When something happens to someone, it's usually from their own circle. Garrett also focused on reports of a white truck in the area that night, the kind of truck driven by this ex-convict. He might be somebody we need to take a look at. Regarding the disappearance of Lauren Spear, do you intend to answer all the questions truthfully? Yes. Also in the mix, a flood of tips about the alleged involvement of current and former members of Indiana biker gangs. Did you shoot her? No, I didn't shoot her. You didn't shoot her? What did you do with her? I don't even know the broad. I told you that. Bye. And then, in the last few months, Garrett received a set of brand new leads from inside a state prison, claiming that some of Lauren's fellow students saw her die and secretly disposed of her body. She OD'd. They got scared and drove her down to the Ohio River and disposed of her body. Three major theories on the board, all being chased. No lead could be ignored, no clue dismissed. So you have to figure out a way to crack that. And that's what I've been trying to do for the last year. All coming down to a fateful few moments. Basically, this mystery is in a block. Somewhere in this block and just in this short distance from here down to there. Literally, you're only talking maybe 100 yards. I'm Elizabeth Vargas. And I'm David Muir. Now that you've seen that first part, you've got to stay here because we're going to comb through those 100 yards, letting you in on every twist and turn of our unprecedented 2020 investigation, showing you what that former FBI agent is thinking in real time. And what that mother is going through as well writing these words to someone who could be watching tonight. I hope you have as many sleepless nights as I do. We're live tweeting tonight, so join our conversation, and we'll be right back. Twenty Twenty continues with Looking for Lauren. It's hard not to get caught up in the energy and everything there. It really is like happy. I feel like part of the community. Yeah, and exactly. With its Big Ten school spirit, Indiana University seems far removed from the temptations and dangers of the big city. You just felt like 
This is what college is supposed to be like. On move-in day here every fall, the emotional scenes are played out as parents say goodbye, just as Lauren's parents, Charlene and Rob did in 2009, confident she was in a good place. I didn't have any qualms about saying goodbye. Did you have any sense at all that there could be danger there? No. No. No, not at all. As far as Lauren's parents knew and heard from her roommates, their daughter fit right in and was busy studying for a career in the world of fashion. She's just bubbly and outgoing, and you just really instantly fall in love with her when you meet her. But what her parents only later came to learn from investigators is that Bloomington, like many college towns, has its dark side. With students describing rampant alcohol abuse and a thriving drug scene. Cocaine, Xanax, all types of different drugs, marijuana, uh, some people dipped into acid. Seth Parker, now clean, says he was part of that scene. It was just a whole bunch of college kids that had money and could afford to do the things that they were doing. Including Lauren Spear. Was it distressing to hear that there was this party scene and she was part of it? I don't think I, I don't think I realized um, what degree, you know, and it was a little bit of a shock. In fact, police found a small amount of cocaine in her room after she disappeared. So drugs, unfortunately, are the key component to this case. On the night she vanished, Lauren was in full party mode soon after leaving her apartment. I think she didn't make wise choices that night, but she didn't make herself disappear. She spent a lot of the evening with a student she had just met, Corey Rossman, who other students would later say described a wild night. He was like, well, me and Lauren were hanging out, just partying pre-gaming before we went to Kilroy's watching the game. They got to Kilroy's around 2 in the morning. So they're only there about 30 minutes. But during that time period, she leaves her shoes and her cell phone in the bar. And I think that gives you some indication about how out of it she may be at this point. Notably not with Lauren that night was Jesse Wolf, her longtime boyfriend since high school in New York. Any rational boyfriend is going to be concerned if you're out with other boys, particularly at two o'clock in the morning, potentially drunk in a bar. So as, as a veteran investigator, does that raise questions of motive, possible jealousy? Of course. When she leaves here, this begins a sort of two-hour odyssey. Roughly two hours between leaving Kilroy's and when she ultimately disappears. Lauren and Corey Rossman leave Kilroy's and walk about a block away to her off-campus student apartment in the Smallwood Plaza. They're going to her room up on the fifth floor of this building, having trouble walking, stumbling. Doors open, they step off the elevator, and there are four guys in the hallway. All fellow Indiana students. And apparently, they don't like the way Corey is handling Lauren. And Rossman supposedly says something smart to him, and this guy decks him. He goes down. So Lauren and Rossman leave quickly. It's now about three in the morning, and they are heading up this deserted alley towards his apartment a few blocks away. She's barefoot walking along here. She actually falls down twice in this alley, according to surveillance cameras. He eventually grabs her, throws her over his shoulder in a fireman's carry, and literally carries her the rest of the way to his apartment, which is about a block from here. She was not cared for in a way that I would want my son to care for another. And that's what kind of gets me, because the circumstances, I think, could have been a lot different had Lauren been uh, escorted back to her apartment. But instead, they end up at Rossman's place. They go in here briefly. Where his roommate later says Rossman got sick. He vomits on the steps. And went to bed. The roommate takes Lauren next door to another friend. It's about 30 feet to Jay Rosenbaum's door here on the left. Jay Rosenbaum. Jay sees what bad shape Lauren is in and said, Lauren, lay down on the couch, go to sleep, go home in the morning. And she won't do it. She says, I want to keep going, I want to go. Jay walks her to the door, and he sees her walk up 11th Street. He's the last person we are aware of that sees her alive. 
As police begin to suspect foul play, all three young men, the longtime boyfriend, the new friend, and the last person who saw her alive are identified by authorities as persons of interest. The three boys that she was with all hired attorneys very early on, and uh, that created a, you know, a wall of access for us. What about Lauren's boyfriend? He helped with the searches on Saturday and Sunday. But then he left, his parents came to Bloomington and took him away. What did you make of that? I, I thought it was odd. No witness reported seeing Wolf out that night, and he says he was at home watching the NBA Finals, which ended just before midnight. And then, according to his roommate, he went to bed around 2.30 a.m. Wolf would not agree to be interviewed on camera by 2020, but says he has cooperated with the police and continues to deny any involvement in Lauren's disappearance. He's the most loving boyfriend you can ask for. You At the time, Lauren's friend said Jesse couldn't have possibly harmed Lauren. He would never do anything to hurt her. I'm, I'm not suggesting he did anything, but I'm not comfortable that I actually know what he was doing in the early morning hours of June 3rd. Even more than Wolf, Garrett has questions for Corey Rossman. There's always been this sort of suspicion around Corey as to, well, did you really end up passing out and going to bed before she disappeared? I was not the last person with her. This is all I can say, I'm sorry, but I just hope that they find her as soon as possible and I'm praying for her and her family. Adding to the parents' anger, they say Rossman was the one friend who refused to talk to them or their investigators. And he claims he lost all memory of what happened after being slugged at Lauren's apartment building. That punch or punches uh, caused him uh, a temporary memory loss. Do you buy that? No, I don't. I think it's a case of self-preservation. He knows more than he's saying? I'm not sure of anything, but what I do know is that uh, there's been a complete lack of cooperation. Uh, and he was the person that spent the most time with Lauren in the last hours of her being seen. And he hasn't come forward to try to help? No. He's resisted. Corey, Brian Ross from ABC News 2020. Can we talk to you for just a second about Lauren Spear? Rossman has denied any involvement in Lauren's disappearance, but declined repeated requests to talk with 2020. Why won't you talk with uh, Lauren's parents? They just want to ask you some questions about what happened that night. Anything you can say at all? property of BC. What else is under the surface here that we don't know about? I don't know, but I'm not to the point to say he's not involved. His lawyer says Rossman continues to cooperate fully with police. Whatever happened, happened in this block, which is why, in addition to the questions about her friends, the reports of someone in this white pickup truck circling the block could not be ignored. Do you remember thinking of killing someone and not do it. Yes. Was it this man? Twenty twenty continues with looking for Lauren. Colleges are a target rich environment for predators. One night Robbie and I got in a car and we drove around at like 3.30 in the morning just to see what it was like. We saw a girl walking home alone, barefooted. Lauren had just disappeared. Across the country in the last five years, some 56 female college students have gone missing. Please keep playing for us. Three have been found dead. We know where Morgan is. Morgan's in a box over there. Four are still missing. Yeah, everyone's looking for you and thinking about you. Including Lauren Spear at Indiana University. There are people that cruise every college campus because they're looking for vulnerable females that'll offer minimal resistance. And unfortunately, a drunk co-ed, particularly the size of Lauren, would be very easy to pick up. So from a predator's point of view, Lauren. Lauren is the ideal target. On the night Lauren Spear disappeared, a vehicle came to our attention. Surveillance cameras picked up someone in this white truck. Is there a possibility that this vehicle could be involved? Absolutely, we have to consider that possibility. 
Why? Because it circles the block during the time frame and the location where Lauren was last seen. Did he happen to be driving down the street, saw her at this intersection, and immediately pulls over, because that's what he's looking for, talks her into the vehicle. That could have taken 10 seconds. At that point, he's got her, and he takes her to wherever. And then Garrett located this ex-convict, James McClish, just released from prison at the time of Lauren's disappearance, who also supposedly drove a white truck like to cruise the streets of Bloomington in the early morning hours. He had just gotten parole for an offense where he apparently assaulted his ex-wife. One of the charges was strangulation. And he was living in a halfway house, probably within 10 minutes of where Lauren disappeared. A female from his past reached out and said, look, you need to check him out. He was there. He's made comments. You know what happened to her? The same thing could happen to you. And she alleged McClish killed Lauren and buried her on his farm in southern Indiana. Even though the leads about McClish and the white truck had been dismissed by Bloomington police early on, Garrett and one of the private investigators working for the family, Bill Benjamin, still had their doubts and tracked McClish down through his probation officer. And so we approached him and we said, would you be willing to take a polygraph? And he said yes. 2020 arranged for veteran polygraph examiner Ralph Nieves, Bring him in. Bring him former in. New York City police detective, to come to Indiana. And what I'm trying to do is to find out whether this individual was playing games with us or is in fact the guy. What if in fact I seen her on TV, I didn't even know she was missing. Before the test started, McClish, who was in prison for assaulting his ex-wife, told Nieves he wanted to clear his name. The story I got was my ex-wife told whoever that I took her, I kidnapped her, done whatever with her, and I buried her on a farm property down home. Oh, did you bury Lauren? Well, yeah, I supposedly buried Lauren. Because my ex-wife was mad at me. I mean, I honestly think it was her. And that's the one that you were in jail for, right? Yes. Does he fit the profile potentially of somebody that could have done this? Of course. He's on parole for assault of women. He was in the community. And here's the more fascinating thing. He then abruptly left Bloomington just a few days after Lauren disappeared. James, have a seat here. Okay. Okay. One cheek here and one cheek there, okay? As Nieves attaches the sensors to McClish, the electric chair. he warns him not to try to beat the machine. <laughs> now, so anybody that tries that, <laughs> wasting his time, wasting my time, because I'm going to know whether you're telling the truth or not. Because right. the computer's going to tell me. In fact, he showed up, does that suggest to you he probably is not he right for He seems to be very comfortable about this. I've been to dozens of these, and I have felt comfortable, and then all of a sudden, they just spike the key questions. The only thing we're interested in now is in justice and in the truth for Lauren. Gotcha. This portion of the test is about to begin. Do you live in Indiana? Yes. The machine reads changes in breathing, heart rate, and the green line, galvanic skin response. Regarding the disappearance of Lauren Spear, do you intend to answer all the questions truthfully? Yes. Do you remember wanting to see someone get hurt? Yes. Do you remember thinking of killing someone and not do it? Yes. And the questions about somebody getting hurt or wanting to kill somebody, all of us have had those thoughts. And we're not really getting any external reaction to these questions. I mean, he's pretty it's flat. Pretty... Do you know where Lauren Spear is? Do you remember causing serious physical damage to someone? Something spiky. Did you conspire with anyone in the disappearance of Lauren Spear? If he bombs us, we're going to go in there and have a long chat with him. The answers and the results when we come back. Twenty twenty continues with looking for Lauren. Regarding the disappearance of Lauren Spear, do you intend to answer all the questions truthfully? Yes. The key question about to be asked of James McClish is whether in the early morning hours at this intersection in Bloomington, Indiana, did he have anything to do with the disappearance of Lauren Spear? Do you know where Lauren Spear is? No. Do you remember causing serious physical damage to someone? 
No. Something's spiking. Yeah, but you have to be careful interpreting yeah. these sure. spikes. Did you conspire with anyone in the disappearance of Lauren Spear? No. This portion of the test is over, remain still until I have released the pressure from your arm. Brian, take a look. We have a preliminary on one, and you can see what that says, okay? In my opinion, you're being truthful. The computer's confirming that on two algorithms. That is no deception indicated on the relevant question that we asked of him. No deception. It means that he's being truthful, okay? How, how do you feel about it? I mean, I was a little insulted when I heard the rumors and whatnot, but I appreciate it. Good luck to you. I wish you guys the best of luck. I really do. Thank you. I appreciate your cooperation. Not a problem. Not a problem. Appreciate your trust in me too. Is it disappointing? No, it's not disappointing. Uh, it actually motivates me on a couple other things that we need to do. So uh, we'll keep just keep hitting it. So back to the investigative drawing board and to a new set of leads about this man and a notorious motorcycle gang. They're the most violent motorcycle gang in the West. The Sons of Silence, so brutal. This History Channel documentary was a catalog of grotesque images. You're in the sun, you're not You're not nice to people. It's the way we are. And many of the new tips led to the man who lives on this Indiana farm. A former member of the Sons of Silence, Robert Strange, who goes by the name of Bodine. No criminal record, but well known to authorities. He's got a reputation for being what they call an enforcer. If you have a problem in your gang, you come to him and he takes care of it. Garrett obtained this online message from one of Bodine's relatives. That she ultimately ended up on his farm. Claiming Lauren owed money over drugs and threatened to go to the police and that he allegedly shot her and buried her on his property. It's very good fertilizer. The message ended. About to go into the farmhouse just to give uh, a heads up in case you don't hear from us in an hour or so. Please do. On a rainy afternoon last month, we went down a county road west of Indianapolis to talk to the man who calls himself Bodie. Hey, how are you? Brian Ross, ABC. Hello, he knew we were coming but he wasn't very happy to see us when we showed up. I like going to get on his camera. Well, this is, it's about the Lauren Spear case. I know what it is. Can, can, I, can, I, can I just show you, can I just show you this? No, no cameras, yeah. Well, we, 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 that's why we're doing this. We gotta, we want no, to. You said you wanted to talk to me about the people that you were interviewing. Yeah, here, let, let me show you. We wanted to show him the text of the message this, this that said he you, shot Lauren. No, did you, did no you, cameras, no did cameras. you shoot her? It's important, Mr. No, I didn't shoot her. No, you didn't shoot her? I didn't do with her. I don't even know the broad. I told you that. Bye. He ordered us to leave his property and later told police if we came back, he would shoot us. But it wasn't the only lead about Lauren and shadowy people from Indianapolis. South Moreland keeps popping up in our investigation. Including a very specific tip about what's called the Mars Hill section of the city and people in the drug world. Everything leads to this house where Lauren was or is. Jennifer Chandler, a meth addict since 16, she says. She took Garrett to this abandoned home where she said Lauren had been beaten and buried. It haunts me, the fact that there are so many people in this small city that know what happened to her. People just don't disappear. They just don't disappear. And it's not right. As intriguing as the lead seemed to be, the reality is I, I couldn't find any of it to be true. Garrett began to find big discrepancies in any connection to Lauren and Indianapolis or drug gangs there. I have her phone records. We've been through her phone records. It doesn't tie to any numbers that I have, and I've got a lot of numbers of these drug dealers. Nothing matches. And the accounts of Lauren somehow being taken from Bloomington an hour away to Indianapolis seemed increasingly far-fetched. You have to understand when you deal with drug addicted people, particularly that have been on meth for a number of months or years, their reality has been altered because of all these drugs. And they have agendas against other people and they want to get them in trouble. And Garrett now believes that may well have been what led to the tips about Bodine, his enemies just trying to get him in trouble. I think it's very possible they were out to jam up Bodine. Why? If you lead a life like Bodine has led, there's a lot of people 
I don't like him. And I've interviewed a number of them, just hate him. And they have put him in the middle of this. So from your point of view, he's off the board too. Based on the facts that we have today, he's off my board. But now a new face on the board and a startling account of Lauren's final hours. It says, man, I knew the guys did that. 2020 continues with Looking for Lauren. Before this commencement ceremony gets fully underway, there is a member of the Indiana University community who should be with us today, but who is not. Graduation was, was a really difficult time for all of our friends. The fact that we were leaving the place without her. Lauren was last seen in the early morning hours on June 3, 2011. She didn't even get a chance to leave with us. Two years after Lauren Spear disappeared, her class graduated from Indiana University. We know that Lauren's disappearance has been a terrible and unimaginable strain for her family and for many of you who knew her as a classmate and as a friend. Seeing her empty room, I just remember we were all sitting on her floor and like we couldn't even speak. It was like we all just sat there and cried. I never thought that I would leave Bloomington without my daughter. And then you come to the realization that you have to. The drive back was difficult. I sort of felt abandonment. Lauren may no longer be with us. The Spears tried to keep interest alive in Lauren's case. We ache for her and um, we want to bring her home. But once back in New York, the tears turned to frustration and anger at Lauren's friend who wouldn't cooperate with them and at the Bloomington Police Department. We were not getting information from the police as far as what they were doing, what they were finding. Uh, of course, that was terribly frustrating for us. They sort of shut you out. That was their policy from the beginning. It's their policy today. Adding to their frustration, Bloomington Police only publicly released these two images of Lauren leaving her apartment and the suspicious white truck even though police had a large quantity of surveillance video of Lauren's movements that night. They haven't shown us any videos. That's in sharp contrast with how other police departments have handled similar missing person cases, like that of Hannah Graham, a student at the University of Virginia. This is Miss Graham. There, the police chief made public all the videos he had. I wanted people to know who we were looking for. Maybe what you see now in this video may cause some recollection. It worked, leading to the discovery of Hannah's body and her murder. But even now, five years later, the Bloomington police continue to withhold the extensive surveillance videos they have of Lauren and shun requests from reporters for interviews, including our... Hey, Brian Ross from ABC. So we waited for Police Chief Michael Dickoff outside police headquarters. Can I ask you a quick question here, sir? We've been trying to get a hold of you to talk about the Lauren Spear case. Mm -hmm and you haven't been very cooperative. And the parents say that you've treated them badly. No, I, I don't think that's true. I just talked to uh, Mrs. Spear yesterday, mm -hmm. gave her you, an update in the case, and... Can you give uh, us an update? Uh, no, because it's, it's still under investigation, and we are, are following up leads, and we're not gonna, we're not gonna try this case in the media. Is so, it but thank you. Is it still an active case, sir? It is still an active case. Why won't you release the videos? Other officers and police chiefs say you should do that. Can you explain why? From the beginning, the Spears decided they could not entirely rely on the Bloomington police to pursue the case. It's a small town and you know, limited resources. So they set up an online tip site, findlauren.com. We got a lead. Just tips from the site about the white car, the ex-convict, and the Indianapolis biker gangs were ultimately all dead end. But now there is a new lead from that fine Lauren site that has led former FBI agent Brad Garrett to the banks of the Ohio River, a lead that he believes may hold the best chance for an answer. There was a kid in, pr in prison by the name of Corey Hammersley. Hammersley, once a star student and athlete in Indiana, got deep into the drug scene, and one year after Lauren's disappearance, had a meltdown high on drugs. Steps out of his apartment, has nothing on, 
but a hat. Takes a firearm and starts shooting into a house. A naked man armed with a gun fired as many as 15 rounds. Captured, prosecuted, and sentenced to 24 years in state prison where the new lead emerged. This is coming through another inmate that was locked up with Corey. They were playing cards. Lawrence picture comes up on the television. Missing IU student Lawrence Spear. And immediately, Corey looks up at the TV and says, man, I knew the guys that did that. The inmate who served time with Hammersley agreed to recount what he says Hammersley told him if we blacked out his face. And they were drinking and got to do an ecstasy, and she OD'd. It scared them. They didn't know what to do with her, and they took her down to the Ohio River and got rid of her, and then he said disposed of her body. This is a theory you are taking a hard look at. Absolutely, because one of the mistakes in most criminal cases is we investigators try to make them too complicated. The simplest is she died at a party in Bloomington, and somebody got rid of her. And it could be right here in this And river. it could be right here exactly at the Ohio River. The theory made even more sense when Garrett learned from Lauren's parents that she had a serious heart ailment, so serious she had to give up sports in school. She had uh, what's called long QT syndrome. It's a heart condition where there's um, irregular heartbeat. It could be very dangerous. And if you couple alcohol, drugs, and a genetic heart issue that she had, that is a toxic mix. The next step, a prison interview by Garrett, his partner Bill Benjamin, and the former student, the naked gunman, Corey Hammersley. You and others you know, maybe had moved her body. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Okay. I've never met this person before in my life. You believe he was lying to you? He clearly was lying to me, but you know, the, the, the most interesting thing was the end of the interview. If something came up, would you contact us? If something was jogging your memory, or somebody brings something up in here, would you like, would you like Honestly, it? probably not. I do not want to be associated with this at all. No. I no. Will, I will not help you. I will not tell you anything I learned. And that's just the way it's going to be. So what does that tell you as a veteran investigator? It tells me he has some reason for lying. All right, thank you. And I knew at that point then. You ready? I have to dig. I have to figure out how Corey knows what he knows. Which led Garrett right back to this block where Lauren disappeared. These buildings where my fingers are, are a prime target as to maybe where she could have ended up that night. In an apartment somewhere off this alley, a drug hangout for students, a two minute walk from where Lauren was last seen alive. Now Garrett is tracking down the students who were known to have been there. I think I'm one interview away for putting this case together. He has their names, he knows where they live, and in the next few weeks, he'll be at their door. We'll be right